Do you want to do audio? Hey, Dr. Mitchell, how are you? So, Hale, it's great to see you. Or your or your name. Yes, my pleasure indeed. Yeah. I'm seeing some other familiar names, which is uh, is terrific. All right, Dr. Mitchell, are we ready? I'm all set when you are, Loretta. All right, then. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Loretta Hoffner. I'm the executive director of the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's last webinar. Um, in our series uh, on lead, asthma, radon, and healthy homes in Maryland, the new resources for clinician and patients. And today's session three will cover case presentations. Our esteemed speaker is uh, Cliff Mitchell, who's the director of the Environmental Health Bureau at the Maryland Department of Health. With that, sadly, I turn over the last webinar to you, Cliff. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to be here with you again for this third and final case pre set of presentations on lead, asthma, um, radon, and healthy homes in Maryland, new resources for clinicians and patients. Um, as we begin, I once again want to thank our uh, co-hosts, uh, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, um, and the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, who are providing CME coverage um, and sponsorship for this uh, event and this series of CME events. Um, so uh, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get started and we'll work our way through um, the uh, slides. So um, as I've indicated previously, at the conclusion of this series of presentations, our hope is that you will be able to identify changes in Maryland laws and regulations re related to uh, blood lead and, uh, and, we'll, and the uh, changes in a blood lead level that will trigger a response from state agencies. Uh, we talked about that in, in uh, the first CME event. Understand recent trends in the state for lead levels, blood lead testing rates, um, and uh, for other conditions, uh, which we covered in uh, sessions one and two, identify services uh, and access services to reduce home-based pediatric environmental health hazards, including lead, asthma, and radon, which we covered in uh, session two, to quickly identify patient needs for services related to home-based environmental health hazards. And that's going to be uh, the theme for today in our series of case presentations. So my hope in today's presentations um, uh, is my hope is that you will uh, use these uh, 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 tools that we've talked about, uh, and I will present some uh, case studies based on the work done by our partners uh, in local health departments across the state, at the Maryland Department of the Environment, in the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and uh, non-governmental organizations like GHHI. Uh, and in so doing, uh, our goal is to provide you as primary care providers uh, with practical as well as theoretical uh, uh, information that you can then use uh, to uh, apply the knowledge from this CME event in a variety of settings when you have uh, children who may have been exposed to environmental hazards in the home. Uh, so uh, without further ado then, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, and uh, my goal is to have this session be uh, uh, interactive. So uh, we won't be doing poll questions in this presentation. Rather, uh, I hope to evoke uh, some discussion about the uh, cases um, and to, uh, at the uh, conclusion, to use these uh, cases as uh, examples for you uh, from your experience uh, to talk about the practical applications. Uh, I do not have any conflicts to disclose. So just to review, for those of you who are new to this series and are viewing this uh, webinar uh, without the um, 
benefit of having seen the first two, I do want to take a moment to review just briefly the programs that we're going to discuss in the context of these case presentations. Uh, so as you'll recall, in 2017, Maryland was approved by the Centers for Medicaid uh, and uh, Medicare Services, CMS, for a health services initiative. Uh, this was an amendment to our state plan for the Children's Health Insurance Program and created two different programs that are specifically focused on home environmental hazards. The first of these is our Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids program. This is a lead abatement program in which children who meet the requirements, uh, they are under the age of 19, they uh, are eligible for or enrolled in uh, Medicaid or CHIP. They have a blood lead level of uh, five micrograms per deciliter or greater within the past six months. And they reside uh, for at least 10 hours per week in the location where the lead paint exposure occurred. And under those circumstances, if there is lead paint or another source of lead associated with the home uh, that can be abated, uh, they are, the family is uh, eligible or may be eligible for services through the Department of Housing and Community Development that would entitle them to uh, services up to and including relocation while the work is done, an assessment of where the lead is uh, identified in the home, abatement of that lead, um, and this allows the Department of Housing and Community Development, as I've mentioned previously, to access funds through Medicaid uh, to abate the lead in that home, not only for that child, but for all subsequent children who live in that home. Uh, this is a program that has been very successful and continues to be utilized by families across the state. Our second program also funded under the Health Services Initiative is the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention and Environmental Case Management Program. In brief, it's a home visiting program for children with lead poisoning or and moderate to severe asthma. So the child, again, the requirements for the eligibility include age less than 19, enroll, uh, eligibility for or enrollment in uh, Maryland CHIP or Medicaid, and either a blood lead of five micrograms per deciliter or greater, or uh, moderate to severe persistent asthma uh, as defined in standard uh, uh, conventional medical uh, terminology these days. So that would essentially mean children who are either on a controller medication or children with multiple emer emergency department visits or children with hospitalizations, all related to asthma. Um, and if this is a child with frequent symptoms requiring a controller medication or frequent symptoms who's not yet been treated with a controller medication, then uh, that child and that family may be eligible for home visiting services. And those home visiting services uh, include both for lead and for asthma. First of all, enrollment in the program. Secondly, a, an, an assessment of their clinical uh, um, needs, not for not as a clinic, not as a clinician, but to understand what medication they're on, to review their uh, uh, asthma action plan if they have one, to uh, uh, provide education through uh, a, a trained educator who has is familiar with the national. Um, uh, asthma Education Program, NAEP, um, uh, the most recent NAEP uh, version. Uh, and uh, also we provide durable materials that can be used to improve environmental conditions in the home, including things like mops for wet mopping, uh, buckets, instructions on how to do wet mopping instead of dry mopping to avoid dust Regen resuspension. Um, uh, we provide uh, information on integrated pest management uh, and crack and fill so that uh, if pests are identified, uh, they can be prevented without the use of chemical pesticides. Uh, we provide 
uh, mattress and dust covers where appropriate uh, in order to suppress allergens. And uh, we also provide up to and including a HEPA vacuum cleaner uh, for families that cannot afford a HEPA vacuum cleaner. So this, um, pr this combination of assessment, home environmental assessment to look at potential triggers and hazards in the home, um, standardized recording of that information uh, using a system which allows us to collect and disseminate that information to clinicians if they are um, engaged in um, uh, conversations with the child, uh, parents, or caregivers to understand better what hazards are home uh, 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 present in the home that may be contributing to the child's either lead poisoning or uh, asthma exacerbations. All of those things um, are done by our team of community health workers and environmental case managers uh, operating out of nine local health departments um, in uh, throughout the state. So this is a flyer, um, uh, which is a downloadable at our website. If you go to the Maryland Department of Health uh, and look for Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids, that flyer is downloadable and it gives you information on how to access services uh, from your local health department through our toll-free number or our website um, or our email address mdh.healthyhomes at maryland.gov. And in addition, these are our nine jurisdictions that are participating in our home visiting program. Um, and they are shown here um, and uh, certainly if you have children who are uh, residing in these uh, locations, um, you should, and they, are, they have a primary or secondary diagnosis of either lead poisoning or moderate to severe asthma, um, you may certainly contact us um, and we will um, uh, arrange for um, enrollment or an interview of the family by the local health department team um, uh, for purposes of enrollment. So let's move on now with that background to some cases after I just provide you with a little bit of background data on who's already enrolled in the program. So um, at the moment, we're in the process of transitioning from our paper-based records uh, to a new online system using um, REDCap um, uh, to record information. So the data that I am providing to you here is not actually the complete data on the population um, that is being served or has been served, but it can give you an idea of those children who are uh, currently in the program or may have been in the program previously, just a, a subset of those, just as a sort of a, a little bit of a picture. So the mean age is uh, 8.6 years. Uh, the children are 43% female, 57% male. Um, almost two thirds are black or African American, um, a little less than 30% are white, 9% uh, are Asian, and then the remainder are a variety of different ethnic and racial groups. Uh, almost half rent a private home and 25% own their own home, um, whereas 19% rent in public housing and only 5% live with somebody else who owns the home. Recall, <coughs> excuse me, that um, uh, with the exception of uh, large apartment buildings or uh, apartment buildings that are owned by corporate entities, many properties, including privately owned homes or homes that are owned by someone else, if the family is living there, may qualify for our program, Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids for lead abatement. And 37% of the enrolled families have one or more children with lead exposure. 72% have one or more children with asthma. And that uh, sums to greater than 100% uh, because some families have uh, children who are duly eligible by virtue of having both lead exposure and asthma. So that's just a snapshot of the children. It is, does not include all of the children enrolled in the program, but it's a, a bit of a picture. So to start with the case presentations, I'd like to start by describing some cases where we've had um, uh, challenging cases with asthma management 
and show you a little bit about how our teams uh, of community health workers and environmental case, case managers interact both with the families and with primary care providers. Our first case is uh, a case from 2019. It's a two-year-old with asthma whose older sibling also has asthma. Uh, this child went to an emergency department for an asthma exacerbation and had been recently discharged for that reason. Uh, the child also was given a prescription for an albuterol nebulizer and for budenicide controller medication, a steroid. Both of those were given as nebulizer treatments uh, and they came in little saline ampules, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So um, our team, uh, I should add that this, um, this was a, a, a family that was primarily Spanish speaking. Um, and we happen to have um, a, um, not only a Spanish speaking community health worker, but we also work with a translation team when necessary so that we can accommodate uh, non-English speaking uh, families. Uh, upon uh, investigation, when the caseworker, the community health worker went into the home, uh, the community health worker notified, uh, uh, noticed uh, a number of potential hazards. These included sort of the ordinary hazards of uh, lack of dust covers on uh, pillows and, and, uh, and on uh, mattresses, uh, uh, some uh, dust, uh, and uh, there, was a, there was a discussion and education around dust education and suppression. Um, the uh, community health worker and the case manager also worked on the uh, family's asthma action plan um, and took some pains to make sure that they understood the family's understanding through both conversation and demonstration of um, how the medications were to be used. So in this case, there were two um, very similar looking translucent plastic ampules, one with budenicide, the controller medication, one with albuterol, the rescue medication, and they both looked identical. And it was very hard to read the writing on the ampules to begin with. But as it turned out, uh, the family was using them exactly backwards. So the family was giving routine administration uh, of the um, uh, Allupent inhaler, which as you know, is a rescue medication, not for routine purposes. And it was giving the budenicide uh, when there was an asthma exacerbation, which is exactly the opposite of um, how the medication was prescribed. Um, in addition, the uh, astute community health worker noticed uh, they, the uh, family had a stacked uh, washing machine and dryer in a vertical closet. The dryer was vented to the inside of the home and um, it was a dry uh, exhaust. So there was, the dryer was, um, when it was turned on, it was, it was actually exhausting lint into the apartment environment. So uh, what happened with this was uh, the, um, uh, the community health worker and the case manager uh, had extensive discussions and addressed uh, the ordinary triggers that were present through provision of HEPA vacuum cleaner, um, uh, dust suppression training and education, dust suppression equipment, including a wet mop and various other things. But then the two issues that were uh, more complicated one was the uh, vent and then the other was the medication issue. So um, the nurse case manager uh, had extensive conversations, both providing uh, the asthma action plan back to the primary care provider, making sure that the, and, and through contact with the primary care provider, explaining the issue of the medication uh, and uh, verifying what the, uh, intention was for the um, 
uh, diet for the uh, uh, prescription, checking out and working with both the um, uh, primary care provider or the primary care provider's office uh, to ensure that in subsequent prescriptions, uh, it was very clear to the family exactly which medication was to be used for which purposes. The other thing that the uh, very clever thing that the uh, community health worker and uh, case manager did was to work with the uh, apartment complex to install uh, basically a wet vent. And the way these work, uh, this is not an uncommon solution, but basically what happens is uh, the dryer vent hose, that sort of metallic silver hose that comes out of the vent is put into a pan of water. It's a very simple but very effective means of capturing all the dust. And as long as the family understands the importance of regularly changing the water so that it doesn't get um, uh, old and stale and uh, uh, is still in the pan, uh, it actually does a very effective job of capturing the wet uh, lint and suppressing dust in the, in the home. So that was a real, uh, it, was a, it was a very, very useful interaction between the case manager, our team at the state health department, the primary care provider, the pharmacist, uh, and the family uh, to address these multiple problems. Our second case is a four-year-old child with asthma, also from a Spanish-speaking family, um, in which uh, during the home visit, um, uh, there were a number of environmental uh, triggers noted, including roaches. And um, the mother also, because there was some uh, mold uh, in the home, used bleach extensively as a cleaning agent, which was no also noted by the community health worker to trigger uh, asthmatic reactions in the, two in the four-year-old. Um, and there were no mattress or pillow covers. And uh, the pr community health worker, because our questionnaire our, our uh, collect data collection instrument includes it, uh, also had noted some safety concerns, including a lack of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. So um, our uh, community health worker and case manager contacted the primary care provider who provided them with a current asthma action plan. Um, and based on that asthma action plan, um, uh, there were a number of things that were done uh, to address these specific issues. First, after the review, uh, the asthma action plan was reviewed in detail with the family to ensure that the family understood medication administration and was very clear on the medication, including uh, rescue and any controller medication. Secondly, our program provided free mattresses and pillow covers, safe cleaning supplies, a doormat, and a HEPA vacuum cleaner, all of which, as I noted before, are covered by Medicaid, so there's no cost to the family. And then there was extensive education on damp mopping, dust suppression, uh, and cleaning without bleach to avoid uh, exacerbating the asthma. Over the course of six visits, um, and these visits are, there's an initial enrollment visit, which is coupled with the um, uh, environmental assessment, the home environmental assessment. Then there are five interim visits where after establishing goals with the family, um, the uh, goals are monitored, their progress monitored, symptoms monitored, asthma exacerbations monitored, um, and the parents' comfort level uh, also monitored. After all of that, on the, by the time of the closeout visit and discharge from the program, uh, the mother was much more confident about managing the child's asthma uh, than uh, going in. So uh, that, was, that was an example of the continuing engagement we have uh, in our programs with the uh, children. Now, let me turn to now a, a couple of more complicated cases uh, to talk a little bit about how we manage these. So the first case is a two-year-old child who uh, uh, in September of 2019 was noted uh, to have a venous blood lead level of 25 micrograms per deciliter. Um, now remember, uh, all blood lead tests in the state um, are required to be submitted to the Childhood Lead Registry at the Maryland Department of the Environment 
uh, and there Dr. Ezatola Kavon um, and uh, the team at the Childhood Lead Registry uh, contacts uh, and, and through uh, both contact with the provider but also contact with the local health department. Um, uh, the uh, local health department was notified of the elevated blood lead level uh, by the Department of the Environment and the family was contacted by the local health department uh, in order to enroll them in uh, the home visiting program and the lead abatement program. So again, let me just uh, to, to reinforce the way this works, after we contact the family, the local health department will conduct uh, for our Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids program, uh, they'll do a screening questionnaire um, and that information from that screening questionnaire is then transmitted to, to the Department of Housing and Community Development where, um, as I'll describe in a moment, what happens is uh, DHCD, upon finding a family that is interested in services under the Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids program, and that the family has been found eligible, which again, remember, means a blood lead in the child of, six, of five micrograms per deciliter or greater in the last six months, a um, uh, age greater than, uh, sorry, age less than 19 years of, uh, old, um, and eligibility for or um, uh, enrollment in Medicaid or CHIP, and then finally, living 10 hours or more in the particular property where the exposure was supposed to have taken place. So <clears throat> the, that determination is part of our Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids program, but we also ask these questions because we then use that information uh, for children who are also eligible or may be eligible for our home visiting program. And in this case, uh, this was one of the jurisdictions that participates in our home visiting program. So um, after the family was contacted, they provided uh, a lot of information and then we conducted our baseline lead assessment because of the lead exposure and an environmental assessment. So this is a picture from the written forms we before we did our online um, uh, application in REDCap. And as you'll see, the arrows are pointing to the data collection instrument where the child reports um, uh, exposure to lead in this residence in that top arrow um, and um, uh, also, uh, also reports um, uh, uh, a, um, and here I'll show you, um, here's, was your child exposed to lead in this residence? Yes. Can you tell me how, when, and where your child was exposed to lead? Biting the window with lead paint. So this was a child who'd been biting the windowsill, very common exposure. Um, uh, has the dwelling been tested for lead paint? No. Um, and remember, this is an owner-occupied home, so there's no legal requirement to test for lead in paint in owner-occupied homes unless they are rented out. Has there been any recent painting, remodeling, renovation, window replacement, standing, or scraping? Yes, the kitchen walls being put up. And uh, then more about uh, risk factors for behavior including uh, hand-to-mouth behavior, um, chewing on painted surface, surfaces, um, and then for asthma, questions about uh, paint, uh, sorry, about uh, pets, and about whether or not there, are, there may be pets in the home. So that's a little bit of an, um, uh, a background, and we do this extensive history in order to document what the hazards are and uh, how to address them. <clears throat> In addition, um, the community health worker, I, I do want to emphasize at this point um, two things. The community health workers are not clinicians. They are not healthcare providers. They are licensed, but they are not licensed healthcare providers in the sense that they can prescribe. They can't do a clinical assessment and they don't do clinical assessments. In addition, they are also not licensed 
risk assessors for lead purposes. So when they make observations like this or when they make observations related to medication, they are only doing it from a lay point of view as what the parent is telling them or what they're observing with their own eyes. But they are not making a clinical assessment. They are not making a clinical judgment. Instead, they are using their trained powers of observation and conversation with the family uh, to observe hazards uh, such as deteriorated paint uh, on fences, garages, windows, trims, and other sources, and then visible paint chips near the perimeter of the house, fence, garage, and play structure. And in the next slide, you'll see, um, uh, you can see here, this is fairly typical, very deteriorated paint, um, which uh, would be very suspicious for lead exposure and you can see there's deterioration on the sills here um, as well. Uh, it raises the question, if you look at this third and second picture, not only obviously the paint on the painted surfaces that has worn off and deteriorated, but look and see these paint chips that are there on the floor, on the ground rather. Um, this is certainly an area that we would have a lot of concerns about the potential for lead in the soil and any child with hand to mouth uh, is going to see a bright shiny chip of lead paint here um, and there will be a risk of uh, going in and, um, uh, and, and picking up that uh, lead chip and ingesting it. And that's, a, that's a, obviously a big risk uh, and something we want to try to avoid. So the complication about this case is that this was a family farm owned and operated by the family. It's not covered under the rental law, so there's no requirement to abate lead. But clearly, um, uh, this, was a, this was a family that was motivated to try to fix the problem. But given the cost of lead abatement services, there's no way with this family farm, including the shed and the soil and the other um, things there. There's no way the family could potentially ha possibly have afforded this. So um, the family was determined to be eligible for the for Medicaid and for the Department of Housing and Community Development's Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids program for lead abatement. Um, again, here are the criteria, child under age 19, blood lead level greater than or equal to five micrograms per deciliter. And the child certainly lived there more than 10 hours a week. So our case manager had a number of issues to resolve, one of which was how to find the resources to do this. But also, this is a family that could not afford to be away from the farm. They couldn't check into a hotel uh, because they needed to continue working the farm. So this was a case where we had to have continuous and complex communications uh, between and among the local health department, the case management team, uh, primary care providing provider and the state agencies that were uh, working on this as well. So it's a very complex undertaking, uh, but I'm pleased to say that um, this, uh, this property is now in the process of being abated and we expect it to be completed in the very near future. Our next case is a child of 19 months with an elevated lead level of seven micrograms per deciliter. Um, this is in a family of four adults. Uh, there are two adults, uh, sorry, there are four adults and two children, um, all of whom are living in this home. Uh, the family notes that there are several people with asthma. And in addition, the community health worker has noted holes in the walls or ceiling and the presence of chipping, flaking, and peeling paint and the presence of pests, particularly mice. And uh, in addition, as the walk around was taking, as the walk through was uh, progressing, the community health worker also noticed recent disturbance of painted services, uh, surfaces due to painting, remodeling, and renovation. And as if there weren't enough already, um, the child has had hand-to-mouth activity, uh, including uh, painted objects. Um, and so there was a great deal of concern about all those loose paint chips and what the child might have been exposed to. 
um, uh, to say nothing of the pets that could track dust or soil in from the outside world. So um, uh, what happened with that was uh, eventually um, uh, we um, had, uh, after a lot of discussion, uh, particularly because of the pets, um, we had a lot of uh, case discussions between the local health department, the state health department, uh, the Department of the Environment, and the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, partly the issue was this is a property that was severely affected. There were a lot of problems in it. Um, there were safety concerns uh, for the children. Um, and, uh, uh, and there were obviously exposure concerns because there was so much lead that uh, during the abatement, uh, there was a real concern about the possibility of secondary exposure to the child. Um, however, the, we, we, as, as we've noticed, as noted in a number of cases uh, with our teams that do relocation um, and uh, participate in these programs, uh, pets are complicated because they are not covered by the um, uh, reloc relocation approvals in the um, CHIP uh, Health Services Initiative. So the family, in most cases, is required to take on the cost of relocating the pets. And this was a significant number of pets and would not have been a small um, uh, expense to the family. Uh, the case manager at the local health department, <laughs> these case managers are incredibly patient and persistent. And they worked with the family over many months to address the various issues. Ultimately, um, it does appear that after months uh, of COVID and negotiations and figuring out where the pets were going to go, it does appear at this point that we are going to be able to abate this property um, and um, safely relocate the family uh, for the duration of that and then have the family move back in, which will be a great boon to the family, both economically and in terms of the health of the family. So those are some of the cases that we've been managing, and I hope they've given you a kind of a flavor of uh, some of the things that, uh, some of the kinds of issues uh, that arise uh, in the course of dealing with lead and asthma and other healthy homes problems. I want to point out before we go on a couple of salient features about all of these cases. Number one, as I mentioned before, the local health department, case management, and community health worker teams are not replacing the clinical judgment of the provider. They are instead serving as both extenders and as uh, people who can get into the home and see how the asthma action plan and the provider's instructions are being carried out in the home environment, which is a tremendous, uh, I think, uh, uh, benefit to the family and to the healthcare provider. Uh, secondly, um, we've worked on smoothing trans, uh, uh, communications between providers and local health department teams, and we really do want the information that's collected uh, to be useful to the um, primary care provider in formulating care plans for the family. So our goal really is to make sure that as we provide information back to the primary care provider, um, we are doing so in a way that um, helps the primary care provider understand how the family is doing in that environment, what the environmental hazards are and triggers are, and what we can do to assist in terms of reducing those potentially hazardous exposures. And uh, finally, I just want to say that um, in terms of our interaction, our goal really is to work cooperatively with the primary care providers um, uh, who are the backbone and mainstay of uh, the clinical care of uh, these uh, patients, many of whom are quite complicated. So there are a couple of other things that we're doing that uh, of interest that I just want to point out as we uh, get ready to wrap up. Uh, the first is that, um, as I've mentioned, we are in the process of transitioning to a new electronic health record for case management within the healthcare systems using a REDCap application. 
Um, these are um, these electronic health records will, and case management records will make it easier for us and the local health departments to communicate with uh, primary care providers because we're now going to be able to uh, essentially generate more standardized um, uh, data instruments and information for the primary care practitioner. Um, our goal is to make sure that primary care providers have a good idea of what the housing conditions are, the environmental health conditions, the clinical understanding, and the, um, uh, all the other factors that influence the child's health that we provide that information back to the local health, uh, uh, back from the local health departments to the primary care providers and vice versa. We want to engage in two-way flow of communication between the primary care provider and the local health department team. Um, so as another way of facilitating that conversation, uh, we are having discussions with the Chesapeake Regional Information System for our patients, CRISP, on the use of care alerts and smart alerts to notify providers, local health departments, um, uh, people who are engaged in care about uh, children whose asthma is sufficiently bad that they've had em emergency department visits or hospitalizations. So the goal here is uh, to use these care alerts and smart alerts. So for example, if a, um, uh, if a patient is discharged from an emergency department or discharged from the hospital with an asthma exacerbation or an asthma uh, hospitalization, um, we will, our goal is to use the CRISP uh, care alerts to notify uh, the primary care provider who's already associated with that child, um, whose association with that child has been um, provided and verified by um, uh, Medicaid as the panel for that provider, that we would then generate a smart alert that would go to that provider, letting the provider know, number one, the child has just been discharged with an asthma exacerbation from either the hospital or the emergency department. But number two, provides uh, specific information to the provider on our home visiting program and instructions on how to access the program if it would be helpful for the um, uh, provider and the patient to have a home visiting component to the care. Uh, secondly, the use of smart alerts. Um, is uh, a little bit more complex, but the goal here would be that the local health departments would be notified if a child were discharged from a hospital or an emergency department with a diagnosis consistent with asthma and secondary or primary diagnoses. Um, and we're talking about how to do that in a way where we have the greatest possibility of contacting the um, uh, families very soon after the child is discharged. Um, our data and other people's data shows that the longer away you are from the event that precipitated the healthcare problem, the exacerbation, the longer the way, the longer you are from that event in time, uh, the less likely the family is going to feel a sense of urgency and want to enroll in the program. So. Our goal is to make sure that these children are rapidly identified, linked to care, and then the families are made aware of opportunities to have home visiting or lead abatement resources. So uh, with gratitude to Carolina Rodriguez uh, at the Department of Health, um, this is a uh, sort of a representation of the fact that we view this program, these programs, as part of the continuum of care of a community-centered medical home, where you have a primary care provider, but you also have interactions with exchange of information on um, a, a network and through conversations with um, uh, the clinical, the other clinical components. Uh, be that um, the case managers, um, pharmacists, 
uh, school health, child care, uh, other agencies that may be involved in some aspect of this problem. If we can achieve that goal, uh, that will allow us to tr have a truly community-centered medical home where uh, we are able to um, uh, use this continuum of care uh, to quickly identify, get into treatment, environmentally mediate um, uh, the conditions or the housing conditions of children with asthma or with lead poisoning. And to do so, and by doing so, uh, this will allow us um, to do something we've been challenged to do, which is to um, uh, make a significant impact on both the incidence and prevalence of lead poisoning and on the uh, severity uh, of uh, uh, childhood asthma. So uh, with that, uh, I wanna mention a couple of resources. Um, again, uh, these are resources I provided in the other um, uh, CME events. And uh, these are some ways for you to find us including at the Department of Health, our lead poisoning prevention homepage, our asthma homepage, um, uh, and our data pages. Um, and at Maryland Department of the Environment, I've given you the um, uh, address for the lead poisoning program, uh, email addresses for our programs, and phone numbers for our programs. And I've also included the radon, the radon uh, program home for those of you who are uh, interested. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank, again, the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, uh, Dr. Paul Rogers, um, uh, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, uh, the Maryland Department of Environmental, uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment, Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program, the CLIP, and the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. And note that uh, this entire program was sponsored um, in part, supported in part by a CDC cooperative agreement with uh, environmental public health uh, tracking. So for that, um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and go back uh, to um, uh, our uh, discussion. And this is after spending our uh, three hours together um, I thought it would be helpful to go ahead and uh, unmute the phones. And uh, we, I know we have some uh, comments in the uh, chat, um, but uh, I think at this point, I'd very much like to hear from you all about um, your thoughts uh, with respect to um, the material that we've presented. So I, with that, I'll open it up. And uh, just go ahead and unmute yourselves or raise your hand. I don't know if you can raise your hand. Uh, or if you've got messages, put them in the chat. Any comments? So, hey, Parni, um, Cliff. Dr. So, e excellent presentation. So, I just have a one quick question, and I'm sure you, this is probably in the system, that the information is triggered by the primary care doctor or when you receive the information regarding the lead level and or the asthma visits, hopefully somebody is making the first phone call to the primary care doctor to seek their permission to access the family. So there I have to give a, I have an acknowledgement uh, to uh, Dr. Ezatola Kavon and before he retired, um, uh, uh, John Krapinski, the nurse case manager at the Department of the Environment. Uh, they continue through the childhood lead registry uh, to reach out to primary care providers as soon as they get reports of an elevated lead level, uh, they're on the phone with the environment, with the uh, primary care providers um, to follow up on those lead levels. So yes, that, that happens still. Um, and we also participate in that process um, to make sure that there's a uh, follow-up. Thanks, Dr. Carney. Other questions or comments? Hi, Dr. Mitchell, this is uh, Rachel Dodge. I actually was on the Maryland Medicaid meeting yesterday, so it was nice that you reminded me that this was related to what you were talking about there. I was like, oh yes, that all fits together. Um, so one of the things that um, that you know always, as we're kind of fit thinking about how these alerts go and how you know people are notified, um, 
you know, are, are there going to be like some sample runs or some ways that we can sort of make sure that, because sometimes I worry that, you know, if, you know, like if the CRISP alert might be in there, but if for some reason it's not linked to the PCP, it doesn't get to the PCP. So, you know, I'm just always kind of, I love all of this great information sharing and us trying to create all these linkages, but like sometimes it doesn't always work and just trying to make sure that we have a way to make sure that some of this is working. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that, Rachel. Um, I think that um, as we have been um, developing our um, uh, home visiting program and the other programs, uh, and working with MDE and the Department of Housing and Community Development and with the uh, primary care community. We've gone to great lengths to have as much communication as we have as we can. Obviously, COVID has put complication in everybody's life about all kinds of communication. Um, and uh, I will say that um, one of the things that our teams do at the local health department is uh, they don't rely just on the newfangled technology. They also use a telephone extensively. They will contact, they will call the primary care provider. Um, it's one of the things that they do um, in case they haven't heard back. So um, yes, we're going to be doing a lot of beta testing of this uh, system. And um, even when it is in fact implemented, assuming that it goes well, we'll also be following up because we're never going to rely on just one communication pathway we'll always do more than one. And I, I also think that <clears throat> figuring out a quick and easy way for primary care practices to submit referrals is really important too. And maybe you have touched on some of that, but, <clears throat> but you know, if that's something that can happen through CRISP or something that can easily happen, that would be great too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and the, the issue of referrals is one that we think a lot about. Um, uh, we actually have a section in the electronic record, uh, our electronic record, the case management record, where we know what referrals are being done. Um, and part of our quality assurance program will in fact be to check up on that uh, recorded referral and make sure that the referral actually happened. So we will in fact, um, and I know Candace Scott is on, uh, one of the things as we build out this system will be to do ongoing quality assurance and continuous quality uh, uh, improvement around things like referrals, making sure that they're actually carried out. Well, I, I'm meaning making it simple for the, because you know I can imagine, and I'm thinking about how I'm seeing patients and doing stuff is that I have a kid who I'm worried about, who I would love to refer into this program. And I'm gonna tell my MA, hey, can you submit the referral? or to the nurse in the office, can you submit the referral? Oh, and you're so, talking about referral to us as opposed to referral yeah, from right, us. Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood, yeah. No, and, and so we actually have a, we have a, a toll-free number that you can call and an, and an email address. So um, jot this down and call us anytime, 866-703-3266. And literally operators are standing by, actually, our staff is standing by, but it's 866-703-3266. And um, we'll connect you with the appropriate local health department and we'll connect the child with the local health department. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I have one quick comment, Cliff. Uh, so in my practice, this is not the, uh, uh, unusual for this particular child with asthma to go to a pulmonologist and an allergist. Medication changes all the time. Dosages changes all the time. So I think this is extremely important to have a case manager type person who can coordinate all that yeah. because yeah. it's really not that easy. And that is where I think the EMR will certainly come into uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of play. And one of the things that we, we do want to do, and this is a conversation that's been going on with our Medicaid partners, is we very much want to uh, be clear about the, the distinction between our case management for environmental case management and medical case management so that the many of the MCOs may have, and many of the primary care providers may have case managers who are doing the medical case management. And we wanna be a complement to that but not get in the way of that and certainly don't want to contradict it. So we want to be very careful and respectful of the fact that 
Um, if there's medication, you know, particularly for complicated patients, I agree with you, Sohail. Um, uh, when there are medication cha changes, we want to make sure that there's effective communication between the case managers as well to make sure that we're up on that. And that's where the asthma action plan becomes really, really important, keeping that up to date uh, and uh, having good communication. That's a really important point. Thanks. Barbara, you looked as though you were going to say something. No, I have another meeting at six. I was, great job, Cliff. Um, I was glad I was able to join this call. I'm Barbara Moore. I'm the director for the lead program at Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital. Um, I'm sure we've received some referrals from many of you over the years, um, but we still have our program. Um, luckily, we've been seeing less and less children with the higher lead levels, which is really great. Um, and I'm happy to call the teamwork that everybody's doing to make this process work smoothly for the families. Right, and I really do want to give a shout out to the uh, uh, Mount Washington Pediatric Hospital. Um, I also do want to say uh, that um, uh, even though we have seen that decline, um, we know that there is a risk because of COVID that we're going to have a number of children who have not been tested for lead recently who may very well have had uh, significant exposures over the last year. So we are certainly anxious to see um, uh, renewed testing. And uh, I'm hoping that, um, that we'll not be uh, surprised, but I do worry. And I know that uh, I've talked with uh, GHHI, with Ruth Ann Norton and others about um, the importance of making sure that we catch up with testing with those kids who have not been tested over the last year. Other comments or questions in the last minute or so? Uh, if not, I'm sure, Loretta, um, that uh, uh, I'll turn this back to you for some final words about the CME portion of the, of the, of the program. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention and for all the work. And please do not hesitate to um, contact us at the um, health department, either the state health department or local health departments, if we can be of assistance. So Loretta, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Again, I just want to thank you all for spending your time with us through these uh, three different opportunities and our three sessions for our webinar on lead poisoning, as well as some other environmental health issues. Uh, you will be con all attendees will be contacted uh, by my office in order to uh, provide you with uh, information about the process for applying for CME credit or for certificate of attendance if you need that for your qualifications. I also invite you to take a look at our website at the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. That website addresses www.mdaap.org to see what other innovative programming our organization is doing regarding the health and safety of our kids here in Maryland. Uh, if you're interested in membership, I'll put in that little plug. We do have chapter only memberships for those of you who are in the Maryland region who might like to join our collective voice speaking for the health and welfare of our kids here in Maryland. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you to Chevelle Bash at the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative and Candace, who's in Dr. Mitchell's office. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you. And I hope you on these webinars have found this information valuable and pertinent to your patients. So with that, thanks again for taking care of our kids here in Maryland. Have a safe evening and goodbye, everyone. Hope to see you on future webinars. Have a good evening. Thanks, Loretta. Everybody. Everyone be safe. Good night. Good night.